Oh my gosh, we are at 100,000 subscribers, which I didn't even think would be possible this soon, let alone at all. We started doing YouTube videos for people who attend my programs to be able to learn more afterwards if they wanted. And then it just exploded into something like I couldn't have imagined or guessed. So I want to thank all of you for all of your support over this last like year and a half. We wouldn't have been able to do it without you. Thank you to those who have subscribed to the channel and thank you to those who aren't subscribed but still watch our videos. We appreciate all of the support that you've given us. In order to celebrate, we'll be doing an updated reptile room tour. Today we'll be doing a tour of this room because most of our reptiles are in here. And next week, or actually in a couple of weeks, we'll probably have something in between. We'll do a tour of the reptiles in the rest of our house. Last time we did a reptile tour, it was about a year ago when we celebrated 1,000 subscribers. And a lot of things have changed since then. It's, we've got a lot of exciting projects now and I can't wait to share them with you today. Before we get started, I just want to mention that we do house a lot of our reptiles in these rack systems. And I know there's a lot of controversy on using racks and a lot of people don't like them, but that's because there's breeders who kind of take them too far and they take advantage of the convenience factor of racks by putting too big of snakes in too small of bins with only a water dish. And we're not a fan of that either. So we strive to make sure that our snakes have enough space to slither around and explore. We use substrate that encourages burrowing behavior. We also have at least one cave in there for them to hide in, along with several objects to provide mental stimulation in their environments. So hopefully today's tour of the rack systems behind me can prove to you that it is possible to keep snakes happy, healthy, uncramped, and mentally stimulated in a rack system. Uh, and by the way, a lot of the snakes that we have like multiples of, I'll probably skip over some of them because I don't want to bore you with five bull snakes that all look the same because these top four bins are all bull snakes. And there's a reason why we kept all of them. Let me show you just a normal looking one first. In here we have, what's, uh, this is Tina. That's right. Hey, Tina. Now this is your average looking bull snake. They have these speckles on their bellies. They have that pattern on their dorsal side or their back, spots on their head, you know, kind of get a good idea of what they look like. She was part of our first clutch of bull snakes. And also in that clutch were almost all normal looking bull snakes, minus this one right here. This is Stripey. He's looking at us right now. I'm going to pull him out. Oh, he's sucking back in. This is Stripey and his name kind of gives away what he looks like. But compared to the normal bull snake that I just showed you, Tina, he's got a, if you'll let me take him out here, you're fine, you're fine. He's got this white belly and these stripes, kind of a, a partial stripe down each side of the belly, along with stripes near his head and kind of a unique dorsal pattern down his back. And because of this snake in that clutch, we kept the rest of the females in the clutch so that we can breed him to them when they get old enough and also breed him back to mom to see if his weird pattern here is genetic or if it's just an individual abnormality with him. Now, it may sound weird that we're planning on breeding him with his sisters and his mom, but in reptiles, this is normal. In the wild, the reptiles or the snakes don't disperse from each other as much as like mammals and birds do. So it's just fine for them to interbreed for a generation or two and that'll be enough for us to know whether his pattern is genetic or not. These guys are a couple years old now. We could power feed them so that they would be twice the size they are right now. And by the way, power feeding is feeding a baby snake like every three days or so to make them grow up faster. We decide not to do that because power feeding decreases their lifespan dramatically. So we're just feeding them at a normal rate so that they can grow at a normal rate and when they're ready then we'll try breeding them. Let's put Stripey back. He's our special little guy. And here is these two more bull snake sisters from the same clutch. This one I should point out though, this is Heather. Dreaded Heather. How are you today? She is sassy. Got that tail buzz going. She'll probably, if I even just try to handle her, want to try to either strike or spaz. Actually, you're not being too bad. Are you getting over your feistiness? She takes after her mom with her attitude. But a lot of bull snakes, if they're sassy when they're young, will usually calm down when they get older because they're not prey for as many things. So they, they get a little more confidence. All right, you, we'll put you back. 
I won't show you the last bull snake in this group because it's just another bull snake. Jane's in here, just another normal looking bull snake. Underneath them, we have a unique species. These are our egg eating snakes. We have two females in here. We unfortunately do not have a male. We are looking for a male so that we can breed them again like we've done in the past. Egg eating snakes are awesome because they have no teeth, but they are very specialized eaters. They only eat eggs, of course. They swallow the egg, crack the shell back here or so where they have some enlarged back vertebrae that crack the shell open. They drink the juices and then spit out the shell again. So in order to feed them, we just scatter around quail eggs or appropriately sized eggs for the snake. And as they're eaten, we just simply replace them. There's one more egg eater in here. Since they have no teeth, they can be housed together. They are not cannibalistic at all, eating only eggs. Here is our first egg eating snake. This is Eggsy and, or sorry, Eggsy and Toothless. And she is a nice big, this is a Daisy Peltis fasciata, in case anyone's curious on what exact species they are. We're really hoping to be able to produce more babies in the future. Next to the egg eating snakes are our Eastern hognose snakes, a male and a female. The male here, We'll be on a Feed My Pet Friday here pretty soon, if he hasn't been already. This is my first, or was my first, Eastern Hognose. These are notoriously sassy as well. They'll hood up on the sides of their head, trying to imitate a cobra, or really just a bigger, more intimidating snake. And I got him from a kid at PetSmart when I used to work there. He took the snake from the wild and was trying to feed it throughout the fall, and then when he wouldn't eat, he came to me concerned, and then I realized, oh, he's trying to feed an eastern hognose snake, and it's wild caught, so no wonder it doesn't want to eat. So I traded him for a king snake I had at the time that was a great eater, and over the span of about three years, he is now, this one, is now on unscented rodents, which is quite the feat for eastern hognoses. His name is Sparkles, because I let a little girl name him. And that's probably the last time I'll do that. a little boy. He is a boy. The female next to him is a bit smaller. She is really sassy. Look at that hood. You are so intimidating. Oh my goodness, I am so scared. Her name is Trace. She came from someone's barn. They had a clutch that they wanted to kill. And a friend of mine took them in. And um, once snakes are in captivity for so long, you don't want to re-release them. But he couldn't get her to eat either, so he gave her to me. And she's doing great. She doesn't want to eat, so I do have to force feed her, unfortunately. But that's the same thing I had to do with Sparkles. So with enough time, she might turn around too. If I push it too far, she plays dead, and I don't want to do that. And I have to wash my hands because that eastern hog nose musked all over my hands. So, hang on. <laughs> Underneath them are a couple western hog nose snakes. Oh, they're out and about, ready to say hi. Hey, buddy. So, oh, you pooped too. Lovely. All right, we're going to have to clean that up. So this is the male. This is a green line, we're pretty sure, pastel. We know he's a pastel, but I think he's got green in him too. But this one is the female. She's gonna shed. She is gonna shed. Look at that, yeah, she's got that nice light colored belly. And although they are considered pastel morphs, I think they look just like normal. So we'll probably sell them as normals, to be honest. Maybe some babies will have a green tint, thanks to dad, future dad. But who knows, they're still a little bit young to breed. She's getting really close, so maybe I'm sure by next spring we'll be able to breed her. They're also het toffee belly, so we'll get some morphs out of them at least. By the way, a really easy enrichment and cheap enrichment toy would be PVC tees, because they can kind of slither in and out of those. They seem to enjoy them. We'll put them back. And you can also get tile samples from like Home Depot. They're free, and you can use those as enrichment. Next to them is our male tricolor hognose snake. Now these always burrow down to the bottom. So in order to find a hognose or a tricolor, you have to look underneath and find their belly. Here he is. Hey buddy. Oh, and he is, <laughs> he's slinking away. The tricolors are a beautiful species of hognose. They are a tropical species as well. So I give them more humidity retaining substrate. Like the, uh, this is uh, particularly eco earth and cypress bedding combined. Here's the tricolor. Really cool little snake. Kind of an iridescent look in the natural sunlight. Some of them will lose the red as they age, but as babies, they're pretty much all very brightly colored. And he did retain that beautiful red coloration into adulthood too. He is breeding size. He's a small adult male, but he can still get the job done. And we'll show you his girlfriend later on. Next, we have more hognoses. There's a lot of Western hognoses in this rack. 
These are a couple cuties over here. We have a condomorph hognose. These are both girls. Future breeders, still too young right now though, of course. She's got that nice solid black, almost solid black belly, which is a sign of a conda along with the white wall alongside her belly and beautiful reduced pattern on her back. She's also head albino, so she has the potential to create albino condas in the future. Next to her is one of my favorite hognoses. I'm really excited to be able to breed her when she's big enough. She's got an attitude right now, but that's okay. This is a twin spot albino. She's got some moss from her humidity box on her. Now being a twin spot means that instead of one large central spot down her back, she has two smaller ones side by side. And you can obviously see the albino color in her. She is a little bit too young to breed, of course, so probably next year we'll be looking at breeding her. She's a good eater, so she'll be able to grow pretty quickly. Now with most snakes, I would not recommend keeping a humidity box in their enclosure at all times. Just use these as soon as the snake goes into the blue phase where their eyes get cloudy until the point where they are done shedding and then remove it because a lot of snakes will refuse to leave their humidity box and they can develop scale rot issues along their belly particularly. So I only use these while they're shedding. Some people use them permanently or keep them in there permanently, which can work depending on the snake, but I recommend against it. Next, we're about, what, halfway done? Halfway done with this rack. Yep. This is probably one of my favorite hog noses. Her name is Bacon. She's the one that goes to programs with me. She actually ate at a program about an hour ago. You can kind of see a lump in her. And by the way, yes, it's fine to hold snakes after they eat, depending on the snake. Some, you look at them funny, they're gonna regurgitate, but some, you can hold them like this and they're just fine. She is another condomorph, and she's actually the mother to the clutch we had last fall. She's got that beautiful, black belly, and that nice reduced pattern as well, just like that other conda had. But she's not head albino or anything, just a conda, but she's the mother to the super conda we had last year. Very, very friendly hognose snake. She was, she had a surprise clutch. I wouldn't have bred her this small purposely, so we're actually giving her the rest of the year off, and we'll breed her next spring when she actually is a good size to breed. What happened with her was we had them in a container like this with the divider like what our Easterns have, and the male snuck underneath one night, and I guess that's all it took, and she became gravid and had eggs about six weeks later. So we weren't expecting that clutch, but they were cute nonetheless. Down here I think we're at, and this one's ready to come out too, we have a male-female pair of Het Snows. And this one, this little female, is one of my best eaters. She thinks everything moving is food, including fingers, so I'm probably just going to leave her in there. Being uh, het snow means that she is both het albino and het exanthic, so being paired with this male over here, who is a bit younger still, who is also het snow, means that they have a chance of creating albinos, exanthics, and snows in the future. And there she goes. Underneath them is another male-female pair. Still too young to breed, but it'll be a future project. And we have one hiding in his tube. They love these. This is another great, cheap enrichment toy. And there he is. So these are hit exanthic and 50% hit ghost. So they kind of have a nice red color. This is the female and the male is over here. So just another pair of hognose snakes. Actually, she's more red. That's really yeah, pretty. Yeah, she's a lot more red. Yeah, red. I haven't really seen them side by side like this. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Just another pair of hognoses. Well, oh, she's... she's <laughs> Ew, pushy. cooties. Oh. Now she's hissing at them. Ew, back into the tube. <laughs> boys. Ew, boys. Yeah, you're too young anyway. That's okay. Hey, cutie. That's an adorable little face sticking out of the oh. tube. No. And there she goes. Oh, we skipped. Huh. Yeah. We skipped this one. Here we have a black rat snake who thinks everything is food. Pull, him out, pull her out here. She might tag me. I don't know. She loves to eat. So if she bites me, it's not that big of a deal. But black rat snake, this is one of our native species, and I have her so that I can um, use her in education and teach kids about yet another species they can find in their backyards. But she's still a little young to show off those features, so she's not incorporated into the programs quite yet. She looks like a fox snake. Yeah, she does look just like a fox baby snake. Corn. Yeah. And by the way, one of the telltale signs of a rat snake is a white jaw. Bright white jaw. Beautiful. You can go back in there. And this little hog nose is also in shed. If she hasn't shed already, she's really close. Nope, nothing yet. She is uh, actually one of my first hog nose snakes. She is hissing right now. Ooh. 
Yeah, whenever she's in shed, she gets angry at everything. She's het pink pastel, so it's another form of albinism, and I'm really excited to be able to breed them in the future. She was a pretty poor ear for us though for a while, so she's a little behind schedule as far as growing goes, but she's catching up now that she's a better eater again. We'll put them back. Then we have these two. Now I'm gonna skip over this one for a second to introduce you to Candy Cane if you haven't met her yet. Candy Cane is one of my original snakes. She's got an interesting story. She is also she's in awkward. shed. Yeah, she's really dull colored right now. You can actually see the white outline of her old skin getting ready to come off. She was earlier today in her humidity box. She loves this thing. But Candy Cane is an albino Nelson's milk snake. She's one of the friendliest milk snakes I've ever met, mostly because I've had her since she was a hatchling. She came from a breeder down in Kentucky that bred so many baby snakes, uh, corn snakes and milk snakes to be exact, that whenever he had a baby that would refuse to eat, he would donate it to the local zoo, I won't say which zoo, but that zoo would take in these unwanted baby snakes and they would freeze them. And the breeder knew that they were doing this. They would freeze those baby snakes and then thaw them one by one to feed to their cobras that lived at the zoo. So it's a good way to recycle snakes that are sick or maybe they're born with a genetic abnormality. But for this snake, she just was a poor eater at the beginning. And thankfully I had a friend that worked at that reptile zoo and he received a new bag, a new shipment of baby snakes. And he called me up and he was like, Emily, do you, do you want a snake from this bag? I'm like, yes, pull one out and save it for me. So he pulled a candy cane out of that bag, brought him home to me and I've had her ever since. She was kind of a picky eater at first, but now she eats like a champ. So she's a little smaller than she should be for her age, probably because she didn't eat well at first, but it's still better than being cobra food, right? Yeah, I think she agrees. The reason why I wanted to introduce her first is because kids at my programs always fall in love with candy cane and they want a candy cane of their own. So what I'll occasionally do with the families who are serious about getting a pet snake is I will teach them everything they need to know about setup, everything that's required, and once they're ready, I will line up a snake for them to adopt. I'll usually keep my eyes open for snakes for sale, like the kind of snake they're looking for. And when I was at the Tinley Reptile Show back in March, you may remember this pickup from that show and in a previous video, I found a family who wanted a candy cane. I found them an albino Nelson's milk snake of their own. Oh, I see a tail. That's all I see so far. Now this milk snake, same species, same mutation as candy cane. He's going to go everywhere. Let me find him first. Ugh, there we go. So another beautiful albino Nelson's, a lot more yellow, I've noticed, compared to candy cane. But still a really nice snake. We picked up this one for a family that lives probably about five hours away from me. But I'll occasionally make trips to do library programs near them. So next time I'm doing a trip is in July, so I'm just watching over the snake for them. And when I make a trip out their way next, I'll drop him off at his new home. So we just have him for the time being. We're just kind of boarding him till he goes to his forever home. All right, you can, you can disappear again. There he goes. Such quick snakes too. Almost done with this rack. In here, we have a couple more hog noses. So I won't go over them very long. They don't really have unique stories. We just bought them for breeding a couple of years ago. I have the condomorph that is the father to the hog noses we had last year. So there you go. Here's our male breeder condomorph hog nose snake. He's gonna disappear. I ran out of aspen fibers, which is what I usually use for bedding for the snakes. But when I was cleaning last week, I ran out and so I had to use this paper-based bedding, which is what I've been using for nearly headless snake because it's nice and soft. But I do not recommend it because all they do is they drag it in their water dish and it sticks to everything. So if you're trying to find a bedding to use for your snakes, I wouldn't use this. I think it was KT brand. Um, just stick with aspen. It's a lot better. And plus it retains tunnel shapes too. This is the male het pink pastel that's gonna be paired to the female right up there someday when she's big enough. But, you know, he's just het, so he kinda looks like a normal snake. And finally, we have Walter. The bins kinda get sticky the further down you go. Walter is the snake from the I Let a Snake Bite Me video. He just wants to eat everything. He's an old man, he's in his mid-20s, and he came from someone who kept forgetting to feed him, so he was really thin when I got him. So I don't blame him for just wanting to eat everything that gets close to his mouth. 
but I don't handle him much because of that. I've tried getting him over the bitiness, but eh, he just wants to continue eating fingers and that's okay. We still love him. He's a great snake, but we just don't handle him. We're done with this rack, but since we're on the floor anyway, we're gonna start at the bottom of the next rack. These are much larger bins. These are 60 quart Sterilite totes. At the bottom here, I have a male in shed. Everything's shedding right now. In shed rat corn snake. It's a mix that is het scaleless. I think you're in blue. Yep, oh, we're yeah. in blue. We're in super blue right now. This is going to be the future dad to scaleless baby snakes. He's got the tail buzzing going. I know, I don't blame you. You can't really see right now. So I won't bug you. And the female is in another bin. They've already been paired, so I'm hoping the female is gravid. But only time will tell with the female. Oh. Next. Oh. Preview. They're coming up. <laughs> they want their food. Next we have Mrs. Wilson. This is the mother to the clutch of bull snake eggs we just recently got. There we are. We're a little bit underweight, as you can see, since she just recently laid those eggs. And he's, she's doing fine. She's eating like a champ, so that's good. I'm not gonna bother her though, because after all the stress she just went through after laying those eggs, or while laying the eggs, she deserves a nice long break. This bin will be interesting. There's two legless lizards in here. One's named Legolas, but I need a name for that one still. One's very friendly, and that one, the new one, is not so friendly. I have food for them. Let's see if I can make them calm down. Or, or he's going to come right out. I'm going to need like a lid or something. Legless lizards will always make a mess of their water dish. Since they are so active, like every day I'm switching this thing out because they just fill it up with bedding. We got the male. <laughs> Male's in his cave, which is a good thing because he would just be a terror if he was out. Here's our female. We're pretty sure female. She'll do some barrel rolls in my hands. This is a European legless lizard or a sheltapusic. They're also called glass lizards because it was once believed that if you held one it would shatter like glass, which is obviously not, thr not true. These are a really unique reptile in that they have no legs, but they are not snakes. The reason why they are lizards well, there's a few reasons, actually. If you look towards the back of her head, she has ear holes, which is a lizard trait. No. Oh, hopefully you can see it there. Right. Legless lizards also have eyelids, so they can blink, which is, you know, snakes can't blink. Their tail also begins way up here on legless lizards, whereas a snake's tail would start way down here. And if you look at an x-ray or a radiograph, the rib bones go only to where the tail is on legless lizards. And snakes, the rib bones go all the way down to where their cloaca is. And they have this lateral groove along the side of their body, as you can see as she's rolling. She's showing up both sides of it. This allows them to expand when they eat large meals or when a female is gravid and has eggs. You are so active. Oh, and the male. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. He's out. Well, we're going to yeah, calm feed, down. Feed them. Yeah, let's give you food and then I'll put her back. They have dog food today, but that is calcium dusted. There you go. They love their dog food. They like eggs, but we're not gonna watch them eat because the male's just gonna come out at us. <laughs> the trick is getting the female out without getting bit by the male. In this bin, we have my favorite snake. This was my first snake ever. This is Janet. I have a huge soft spot for him. He's retired from programs because he's starting to get up there in age, but he, oh my gosh, when he passes, which hopefully isn't for many, many years, I will be so sad when he passes, but he is an awesome snake. He was abandoned in someone's apartment. Somebody, I guess, didn't want him anymore because they threw him in a box and left him in the closet when they moved out. And the next person didn't see him until they moved in like six months or so later. So he was very, very skinny when he was found and then surrendered to my local herpetological society where I promptly adopted him. And thankfully, bull snakes are like garbage disposals. So he ate like everything for us. And over the course of like two, three months or so, he gained most of that weight back. And now he's the father of all the bull snakes we've bred so far. Now the eggs so far this year, there's some from different parents, but all the babies here are from him. So you are Stripey's dad. Maybe you have that genetic morph that caused Stripey to be Stripey. I don't know. We'll find out. Bull snakes usually have a big attitude, but this one is the friendliest bull snake I've ever met, which is why I'm so fond of him. He likes to just sit and lick things too. What is that? He has a fascination with sticks. Yes, he loves licking sticks. 
and he'll sit and like lick a log for 20 minutes before moving on. So I don't know what's going on in his little mind, but it keeps him occupied, that's for sure. Let me sit you back. I love you, Jan. Oh, by the way, we named him Janet because we thought he was a girl at first. So that's why he has a girlish name. He doesn't seem to mind though. I do have these signs in front of a couple of the bins because it prevents the snake inside from nose rubbing. I've found it really reduces that behavior and nose rubbing isn't a good thing because they can eventually rub their nose raw. So in order to curb that behavior, you need some sort of barrier like the sign. Next would be the new giant Madagascar hognose, one of them anyway. At the most recent Tinley show, we picked up a male and two females. This is one of the females out of quarantine now. I have not done a care video on these guys yet because they have not been eating regularly from me quite yet and I want to wait until they do that before I do a care video. But they look good still, I just wish they would eat better for me, but they might still be acclimating so we'll give them a little bit more time. This is the largest species of hognose snake and the, the females can get upwards of like seven feet. I mean this one's probably about three and a half feet right now so she could double that size before she's full grown. Here we have uh, Vulpix. This is one of my Western fox snakes. And there's a little male in the cave as well. He is adorable. This is one of the few species you can cohab or house together. Fox snakes are one of the most docile species of snakes out there. They might buzz their tail a little bit if you find like a wild one, but after a couple minutes they calm right down and they're like this tame. Vulpix here is the biggest fox snake that I have at the moment. I used to have another fox snake, but she unfortunately passed away due to old age. So now she's my main breeder female. This snake was found in a box at the end of someone's driveway originally, and the box said free snake on it. So a friend of ours picked her up and didn't want to keep her, so we ended up taking her off his hands. But when she was first picked up, she had this huge wound on her back, and you could see her back vertebrae actually sticking out through her skin and her scales. So after, it's taken about two years we've had her now, but the, the wound has actually healed over and there is quite a bit of a scar but it doesn't seem to face her one bit. Pull out this guy. This male is a captive bred male from one of my friends so that they're unrelated and I always want to get captive bred whenever possible. He will be big enough to breed hopefully next year. The tough part with fox snakes and breeding them is they like it really cold. You have to cool them down to about 40 degrees Fahrenheit for a good three months before they actually want to breathe in the, the following spring. Many people will brumate their snakes at about 55 degrees Fahrenheit and if you do that with fox snakes, you're not going to get any breeding behavior out of them at all. They need it really cold. It's kind of surprising. The cord back here, by the way, is the probe to the thermostat and we have our thermostats hooked up to multiple bins. So we'll put the probe in the middlemost bin in the series that it controls so that it takes the median temperature and it can read that temperature and adjust as needed. Up here, I won't take him out. This is just another bull snake. He's Janet's replacement since Janet is now retired from programs. This is Stanley, round Stanley. He's still in training. He's kind of skittish, but he doesn't bite. He's just a little wiggly. It's like, what is that? <laughs> And he's not sure what to think of the camera. <laughs> Up here is creepy Cooter. Cooter! Hey buddy! He's from a previous video. He's a, a rescue. He's still, he's actually looking a lot better. This guy was another apart, apartment abandoned snake. He's in shed. Super skinny when I got him in going shed. Of course, he's going into shed right now too. He is a blood red mutation corn snake and corn snakes being in the rat snake family also typically have that white jaw. He is very friendly, a great eater. He was just neglected in his previous home and his spine still comes to a point or his sides come to a point, which is a sign of him being a little bit underweight still, but we're still working on it and he's gained a ton of weight since we first got him. And he's been part of our programs. He is very willing to eat a mouse in front of an audience, which the kids get a huge kick out of. We won't be using him for breeding though because the blood red mutation of corn snakes typically has neurological issues. He doesn't thankfully, but we wouldn't want to breed snakes that are known for having genetic issues, you know? So we won't be using him for breeding. Next up is Actually, I won't take him out. That's just another giant Madagascar hognose, but he's kind of a pain to get out of the bin. So I'll leave him in there. Up top, we have Mr. Wilson. He's the father to the bull snake clutch we recently had. And it looks like he pooped. 
even though I spot cleaned just this morning. I think he waited until I cleaned. Yeah. And then he decided to poop. So let me, there's a bag somewhere around here. There we go. Now that's clean. Here's Mr. Wilson. He is a hypoalbino bull snake and he is het white side and het exanthic. So he has all sorts of genetic mutations going on, both color and pattern mutations. He's the father of a clutch that's currently cooking and two we're, clutches. yeah, two clutches that are currently coaching, cooking and they'll be hatching in about three or four weeks. So I can't wait to see what his babies look like. We got him specifically for breeding purposes because of his genetics and I'm really excited to, uh, See what turns out of it. He's also prone to nose rubbing, so I cover up the front of his too. Okay, we're done with that rack. Now on to the last big rack in this room. A lot of hog noses over here. This is a normal female. She is the mother to the clutch of 14 eggs we have cooking. She is ravenous. We've been feeding her twice a week to get her weight back up, and she could eat every day if we let her, but twice a week is good for you. We don't need you getting fat. Next to her is a condomorph female we're hoping to breed, but she's a little too high strung. So I don't know if anything took, but she's pretty. Nice little rusty red color. If she doesn't want to breed this year, maybe she'll be big enough and feel secure enough to breed next year. Then we have just another corn snake, another fox snake. You've seen plenty of those. And here is something different. This is a tricolor hognose snake. Come here. Now I have her on Aspen because one of my hog noses or one of my tricolors was showing some signs of scale rot in the tropical soil. So I'm kind of doing an experiment to see what soil I like the best. This is an adult, uh, adult-ish female tricolor hog nose snake. We've had her paired with our male several times, but I have my doubts on if anything took. She's chunky, but I think she's just fat. She's actually on loan from a friend of ours with a &R Exotics and we're hoping to get babies, but we might not. And that's okay if we don't. We tried, we gave it a shot. There's always next year, yeah. Then, let's see. Oh, that's right. Maybe if you keep up to date on the channel, you'll recognize this snake. This is the adorable little ball python I recently adapted from PetSmart. She's also in blue. That's the th cool thing to do right now, I yeah, guess. Yeah, exactly. This is the little girl that wouldn't eat from my local PetSmart store, so they let me adopt her, and she was eating from me <laughs> that same day, surprisingly. So she must have just been too stressed out in the store environment and just needed somewhere calmer to live. She has a humidity box, which she occasionally goes in, but she doesn't want to use it right now, I guess. I may have to make the hole bigger. Find your cave. There you go. We won't be keeping her either. We're just ha hanging on to her until she can gain weight since she's a little bit underweight since she didn't want to eat for so long. And then we'll adopt her out. This is just another tricolor hognose. That one's ours. Yeah, this one's our female, but still just another hognose. Don't want to bore you with too many of those. Down here would be Ed's Woma pythons. Now these are unique. We have a male on the left and a female here on the right. They are starting to get a decent size, actually. I always forget how big they get. Yeah. until I take them out. Here's the female. I'll take out the male too. Oh, male's super twitchy. Funny thing about Woma pythons is they're very like robotic in their movements. They twitch back and forth and they get about five feet long. And because of that, they make really good starter snakes along with the fact that they're good eaters. They make really good starter snakes because you don't need a huge enclosure in order to house them. They are also immune to venomous snake venom in Australia where they will feast on the venomous snakes quite frequently. They can, however, be food motivated where they just really like to eat. And sometimes fingers might look like food instead of the mouse that you're holding. We haven't really had any issues with them being bitey when it's food time. They seem to be pretty polite, but they are handled quite a bit. So I don't know if that makes a difference or not. She'll actually eat out of our hands. Yeah, this one will eat out of our hands. She's super tame. I really like this snake. She's the one that goes to programs with me. He's a little bit more twitchy on the other hand. Oh, it's too close. Can't focus. <laughs> he keeps getting closer too. Down here are two, actually just two bull snakes. More bull snakes, sisters of Stripey that we're hanging on to until they're old Janet's enough to breed. Janet's daughters. Yep, Janet's daughters. In this bin, we have, it's split. We have two males, an albino and a snow, except for the snow is with a girlfriend right now. The albino, however, oh, there he is. He's a cute little albino. He's proven. He's the father of our clutch that we had, one of the clutches we had last year. Cute little guy, wants to eat fingers. 
that's okay. As long as they're a good eater, that's really all I care about. Next to him is a, oh, another species of hognose that I wanted to show you. This is a Mexican hognose snake. These have, they, they're very similar to Western hognoses, but they have a different scale count on their face and their eyes are huge. Here you go, we grabbed a normal Western on the left so that you can compare it to the Mexican hognose on the right. If you look at their patterns, you'll see that there's more of an irregular pattern in the Western and the Mexicans have that dorsal spot along with the very pronounced side spots uh, on each side. The Westerns have those too, but there's also other irregular patterns mixed in between. Much more uniform, I think, in the Mexican hognoses. Next, if you compare their faces, the Mexican hognoses have much bigger eyes and darker eyes than the Westerns. It makes them look really derpy and pretty cute. And I guess we'll put this little Western bag. This is the male at snow that I showed you earlier. The snow that's normally in here is with a girlfriend on honeymoon. And here is Huff and Puff, a het albino Western hognose that I got from my friend Chad, who's hopefully watching this. Here's the snow, his name is John, get it? And this is Huff and Puff. She's usually huffy and puffy. She lives up to her name. With this pairing for a little review, she's het albino again. This is a visual snow, which means he's both albino and exanthic. Half of their babies will be albino het exanthic, and the other half will be het snow, or they'll be double het albino and exanthic since they'll get both of those traits from dad. I love the snow morph. I didn't care for it at first. I thought it was overhyped but it's really grown on me after getting John here. I couldn't resist him. I found him at a reptile show. A really nice thing about having a snow as your male breeder is that you can use the same snake to breed with females that are het albino, het exanthic, or het snow. You can use him for many different projects because he carries both of those genes. So we're hoping that if he proves, or if he becomes a proven breeder and he's able to create good eggs, then we won't have a need for the het snow male that I showed you earlier because he is visual snow. Go find your lady. That's just another hognose snake. Um, down here we have, in the front, this is Tutti Frutti. She is a Mexican milk snake. Hey, sweetie. Her scientific is, has recently been changed to Lipropeltis abnormal, in case you keep track of the scientifics with milk snakes nowadays. I'm not feeding you right now. You eat at programs. She's a little chunky. As you can see, she's kind of got some cleavage. So she would like to eat more often than I actually feed her, but you're kind of on a diet. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Down at the bottom, we have toads. Since we have a lot of hognose snakes, which are notoriously picky eaters, since they like to eat just toads, I have to occasionally, with certain snakes when I first get them, scent rodents with the toads. So I'll take the rodents and I'll actually rub it all over their back to scent it, and then I'll present it to the snake. Makes things a lot easier. It's a lot easier than force feeding anyway. So we have toads just to help feed some of our picky hognose snakes. There you go, we've got a male and two females. We would like to breed these someday so that we can offer toadlets or baby toads that have just metamorphed from tadpoles to the general public so that people can use those to feed baby picky hognose snakes. So that's a project for the future, but in the meantime, they're kind of cool little pets to have. I don't know. Hey guys, are you hungry? Okay, I'll feed you after this. We have two more bins. Each one has a tiger salamander in it. This one, he's usually, oh, he's not under his favorite log today. In here is Thomas. There he is. He's under another log. Thomas is just a tiger salamander. He regrew this leg right here. We actually had it recorded. It's in a previous video of ours. And the regrown leg is, as you can see, smaller than the other one. And often salamanders, when they regrow a limb, the new one isn't as big because it just has to function. It doesn't have to look as nice. So he has an elbow, he has toes, he's able to move. That's all he needs in order to survive. So that's all he grew. Are you hungry? Yep, I think we're hungry. <laughs> Salamanders are hungry all the time and they will eat to the point where they become fat. So you don't feed them as often as they would like to eat because you don't want an overweight salamander. There's another one in here somewhere. Oh, I see a head. There's his head. He thinks he's hiding. There he is. This is window well. I bet you can't guess where I found him. Just uh, eh, another salamander. He has all four of his original limbs though, as far as I'm aware. Salamanders are one of the easiest pets you can own because they don't need additional heat sources. There's no heat tape underneath their bins. Same with the toads. They'll eat just about anything you throw at them 
and they're docile. Oh, he's trying to eat the dirt that fell. They're not very bright, but it makes them really cute too. There you go, digging away. By the way, water dishes are optional for salamanders because they'll just make a mess of them anyway. So I occasionally fill it up and set a minute for a bath, but after a couple days, they just fill it up with dirt. We're finally done with the three racks that are now behind you right now. So we've flipped around and the last rack we have is this baby rack right here because in this underneath it, there is one giant Madagascar here, but everything else is empty at the moment. So up here, half of most of them are empty too, but we have a few critters. We have two of our remaining hognose snakes from last season. They are great eaters of live rodents, but they refuse to regularly eat frozen thawed rodents for us. So before we sell them, we want them on frozen thawed. So we're hanging on to, well, actually we're only gonna sell this one. This is a condomorph. The other one is one that we're holding back. I don't know if you remember him from last year, but he's the super conda that we got from that clutch. This one's growing. He loves eating, but only if it's live. So again, we're really trying to work on them. Hognoses are notoriously bad eaters or picky eaters. And we're just happy we got them eating something, but we still don't want to sell that conda until he's eating frozen thawed, because that'll be much more convenient for his future owners. Speaking of babies, this is our adorable baby fat-tailed gecko that we have available. Actually, I think it's already found a home. Just to show you how big he is, let's hold him in my hand here. Well, you can kind of see. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to be held right now, I guess. He'll be going to his new home soon, so I'll just cover him up for now. Underneath him is one of our newer projects. This was kind of a surprise project. We bought this snake as part of a group of other snakes. We really just wanted the scaleless rat snake, but the guy wouldn't sell that unless you bought this one too. So now we also have a Mexican black king snake. These are gorgeous snakes in huge demand right now. We thought about selling her because we didn't really want a Mexican black king snake, just got her because we had to. But with how in demand they are, we think we'll actually keep her, raise her up, and then find a male, which we'll probably borrow a male from my friend, and breed them and get babies in the future. But I can understand why people love these snakes. I mean, that beautiful black color, super cool. So we'll set you in here for now. She's also just chilling in the baby snake rack. We're going to be using this this rack mostly for the baby bull snakes and hognose snakes once they hatch, which means we have to move the gecko and hopefully that snake before the eggs hatch. We'll see if that actually happens. The last thing, because everything else is actually empty except for this one. Last thing, and I won't open this all the way because they're very fast. We have our three remaining hybrid garter snakes. This one up front is, has actually found a new home. I'm just waiting until the new owners come back from vacation so I can mail her over to them. And inside of the cave, there are a couple more that uh, I just aren't eating regularly yet, so I'm hanging on to them until they do. In case you don't already know, behind me is the birdcage for our blue and gold macaw, Cheyenne. We had to put her in a different room though because she thought the video was all about her when we started recording, so she had to be moved. But I'm gonna go get her so I can show her to you before we wrap up. Here she is, this is Cheyenne. She is uh, 18 years old now, but as you know, macaws live a long time. They live around 50 to 75, give or take. She does pluck her feathers because she's a rescue and she picked up a really bad habit, kind of like chewing your nails, and now she just continues to pluck. We have tried sweaters and cones and uh, additives to her diet to get her to stop. Nothing seems to work. We have a couple new things we're gonna try, but... She doesn't have a lack of toys either. Yeah, she has plenty of toys to keep herself many, mentally stimulated and lots of attention from us. So it's really not neglect that's causing her to pluck. It's just a bad habit, isn't it? Yeah, but that's okay. We still love you. You're our baby. So all of that was just this room in our house that has most of our reptiles, yes, but still there is a lot. So we're gonna cut the video here so that it doesn't go on too long. It may have already gone on too long, but Anyway, we'll show you the rest of our critters in our house in a couple of weeks. Next week, we'll probably do something else just to mix it up, but then we will finish the reptile tour after that. I hope you like the new logo. You've probably noticed it by now. I love it. We did that to celebrate 100,000 subscribers. However, it means that I need to get new work shirts, so stay tuned for those. Maybe we'll figure out something for merch too. I don't know. Thanks for watching this first half of our tour, and thank you again for all of the support and I can't believe we hit 100,000 subscribers. So thank you again for all of that and we'll see you next time.